Let's be brutally honest right now. That's a big question. I'm looking for someone who doesn't want to go to base camp, but they want to go to the very top. Whether it's here, India, New York. Civilization was born at happy hour. That's what wins. That's what stands out. That's what people are interested in. <laughs> That's what I want to know. The Hospopreneurs Podcast with James Henderson. Hello and welcome to episode 119 of the Hospopreneurs Podcast. Jeremy Fleming is the managing director of Stage Kings, the company responsible for some of the most well-known temporary event structures of the past five years, building stages and sets like the opening ceremony at the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games, the set for Ninja Warrior, Shakespeare's Pop-Up Globe Theatre in Melbourne, Sydney and Perth, and Ultra Music Festival. Navigating the company through the most difficult time the event industry has experienced, completely shutting down in March 2020. Jeremy saw an opportunity for Stage Kings to manufacture work from home office furniture, filling a gap in the market and not just keeping the company in business, but enabling it to thrive. After re employing his staff, an additional 70 more out of work event crew have been brought on to help manufacture the ISO King furniture range, and the company has donated over $50,000 to Support Act, an Australian crisis relief charity for the music industry. Hello and welcome to the show, Jeremy. Hey, James. Thanks for having me. Anytime. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on. It's a totally different world to when you started Stage Kings and I'm super, super excited to hear about all the incredible work that you're doing. I know that your business has been booming for you, so I'm really pumped to get into your background and then how you've People don't want to use the word pivoted, but how you have pivoted with the coronavirus into what you're doing now. Before I do get started, though, the first question I like to ask on the show is a crazy hospitality story or exceptional hospitality experience. Can you tell us a bit more about uh, which one you've selected and the story itself? Sure. I'm going to tie it into an event as well. Basically, we've done a couple of stages for the Candyman. His name is on the Gold Coast. He's an infamous man. Infamous. Yeah, that's right. So we've designed and built his infamous backyard stages for the last few years. He came to us a few years ago and said, uh, we want to build a stage, but people are telling us they can't do it that big in the backyard. And we, we looked at it and said, I think we can go bigger. And so we did that. And uh, last year, we made a 20 meter tall sculpture scantily clad is the way he likes it but we made this sculpture in his backyard and I, i've never seen hospitality like it the food and drinks and everything's put on this is for a christmas party all invite only and he pays for everything so I, i'm going to ask first question on that one is what so what was this sculpture made of so we made her out of it was hand carved polystyrene, so a thin layer of polystyrene around the front that we hand carved, and we made a steel armature in behind that. And we carved her down in Sydney in our workshop, and then put her into pieces. And it was the funniest thing you've ever seen. These are uh, two full semi trailers of body parts traveling up the coast <laughs> highway. Oh my and, uh, goodness! Twenty meters tall. It, it was really quite unbelievable. So yeah, if you, you look up the Candyman party, you'll see quite an amazing stage. And so more, more on the Candyman, you probably can't disclose too much about the party itself specifically, but what sort of people were attending this party? All different people, a lot of influencers, a lot of his personal friends and business associates. And I think the, the party is his way of advertising. And yeah, it's something like I've never experienced before. Goodness. Thank you so much for sharing that story. I'm sure there's a lot more to it that we can't disclose on the show, but thank you for sharing that one with us today, Jeremy. I'd like to ask why you do what you do. So on, on a really broad scale, what is it that really inspires you? Let's talk pre-COVID. The reason we started Stage Kings was really to create these structures that people can't believe are even possible. So we want people to come to an event or a music festival or whatever and see what we've built and just say, wow, how's that even possible? So it's really just for that, the creativity in what we can do. People coming to us and trying to explain, yeah, they've got these massive ideas and we say, yeah, we can do that. We can go bigger. That is what gets us up. Fantastic. And you said the pre-COVID, has it changed? Because people talk about like why you do what you do is fundamental and, and should be behind what it is that you actually do. Has your why changed during COVID and in a post-COVID world? Tell us more about what actually sits behind that. You mentioned there about creativity, a bit of a double barrel question here, but I'm interested to know what it is that really sits behind all of that that drives you and then to explore how you're executing that now. 
Yeah, so our why has certainly has changed for now. We, when COVID hit, the events industry obviously shut down completely. We were faced with having to put lay off all of our staff. We had 23 staff working at the time and we had to make that heartbreaking decision to lay those guys off because we had zero income for the foreseeable future. And so we very quickly had to make a decision on what we were going to do to change that. We weren't prepared to just lay down and let that happen. And we made the P word, the pivot to making the work from home office furniture. Now, it's obviously very different to what we were doing. And so our why behind that was really first and foremost to get our staff back working. And so if we could get our crew back working, we also made the decision that if we could support the greater events community and we would do that and bring in more of out of work event crew to help us with making the furniture. So we did that. But the why was really to help the industry and our people and to give people that had just been told they needed to work from home a cheap, easy solution for setting up a home office. And so tell us about the actual decision that took place there, because obviously the whole industry was thrown out. And from what I've heard, it was essentially a conversation and a hobby that came into this. And you're just like, cool, let's just do it. Exactly. We So Mick Jessup, our head of production and I, so the, the company's made up of my wife and I, Tabitha, uh, we own the company and Mick, our head of production, is a very major part of it. And so we were trying to work through anything we could still do. And the, like I said, we had to make the decision to lay the people off. And so Friday the 13th was when the ban went, came into place. The following Friday the 20th was when we told people we had no further work. And that Sunday, I was talking to a friend of mine in Ireland, and he mentioned that they were going to start looking at furniture and perhaps we should look at the same thing, which really got us thinking a lot. And I messaged Mick and said, we must make work from home office furniture. There's whole industries of people now working from home. I already knew that office works had no furniture, no desks for sale. They were sold out, as was Ikea and all the big suppliers. And so I messaged Mick on that Sunday morning. And by the following morning, we agreed to meet again and look at what he'd done. And he designed up a desk and a stand-up desk, as well as 3D printed a couple of prototypes of those to show And they were perfect. They were just what we thought we could use. And we cut the first prototypes on that Monday. So the idea was Sunday, then Monday that we had the prototypes. Monday evening, my wife Tabitha wrote the uh, e-commerce site for the website, which none of us had any experience with. (laughs) And she watched some YouTube tutorials to, to learn how to do that. Wrote that overnight. And then the Tuesday morning, we took some photographs, put them onto the site on Tuesday afternoon, and we were live by 3 p.m., which was a very quick turnaround. Fantastic. And and I guess this really demonstrates the the power of what this opportunity in some ways has allowed people to do on the fly. You've essentially gone through this crazy storm of a process to actually just do something within a few days. And it's obviously stuck with the audience that, that you were dealing with Are you selling to the same people as well? You were talking to corporates and and now you're talking to consumers. So what sort of change took place there? Or were you just talking to the same people? It's certainly a different audience. So I wrote an open letter and this was basically just outlining the story that our why had changed, that we needed, our industry was gone for God knows how long. And so I wrote a letter saying, never trying to sell anything, but just saying we were going to start making these desks to try and support the industry. We were going to bring event crew in to do that to help us with it. And really that this was our why was to help the industry and to uh, try and give an option for these desks. And it really connected with people. And that first post that I did, so I posted it on Facebook. We had, I think, very few followers at that stage, 1,500 or so. And within uh, only a a, a very short time, a week or so, that post had reached over a million people. People really connected with it. And that's what kicked things off. And ever since then, we've kept a very close dialogue with our followers. And to the point now where we're asking people what it is they want, what problems they have, what they need, and then we develop those. So it's now really community-led what the products that we're coming up with. How has your model in terms of how you actually do business, it sounds like you've structured things a little bit differently that now you're getting input from your customer more than you did previously. That's just what I'm feeling from your answer. Tell me if I'm wrong there too, but how has your way of doing business changed? We very quickly had to change from a B2C company to, uh, sorry, B2B to B2C. We had to learn a lot on the fly. We did some things uh, that weren't right to start with and we've learned from those mistakes. Uh, The first e-commerce site we set up wasn't powerful enough for what we ended up doing. So we're now with a Shopify account. But yeah, direct to consumer sales and customer service is very new to us. Customer service, obviously, we were doing previously, but such a much larger scale now. 
To start with, we thought we'd sell a couple of hundred desks. And after only a few months, we're over 15,000 items we've sold. So we very quickly had to learn to scale up. Absolutely. And, and that's wild. But the feedback that you'd be getting would be a lot faster and a lot more of it, I think, with B2C. And anyone listening who's dealt in both of them will know they will may very well be nodding, thinking that they are drastically different in the way that you have to operate. But to touch on there, so you've sold 15,000 items. How has your range changed? So you had the first prototype desk and how many of those did you sell and how's that changed? And what's your sort of range looking like now? So we did, we started with the first two desks, the stand-up desk and the normal desk. Now, both of those we've sold, I think it's in the thousands or maybe 5,000 pieces. And so that we then developed further the monitor stands and laptop stands. And from that, that's when it started to move more away from the home office. And we came up with these puzzle boards, ergonomic puzzle boards for people to use and shoe racks. And really then it's people have just told us and we've run with that. For example, cat towers was a massive one. You know, we had over a over thousand people tell us that they wanted a cat tower. So we made those. And now we're making surfboard racks and skateboard racks and scooter racks and wine racks and all these things to help tidy up around people's houses as well. So Jeremy, there's obviously a lot of different products you now offer. What do you call the market that you're playing in? That's a very good question. It's actually something I haven't put a title on. We call the range the ISO King range. So we really did focus to start with on people that had newly found themselves isolated and in isolation and working from home. It's developed so much more than that now, and it's really community-led innovation. And so I guess it's more community solutions. I understand it's difficult to put a label on that because you're obviously dealing with a lot of different things, a lot of different markets there. Because it's emerging too, this work from home product market, like work from home support products, I, I don't even know what to call it myself. I was interested in what you were calling it because how do you then decide what products you should be bringing out next? Yeah, it's really entirely within a dialogue we have with our followers. We're reaching over 250,000 people a week now on social media. And so someone will make a suggestion, which we encourage, and we'll then say, oh, okay, if enough people want this, then we'll have a go at it. And that's how everything's come about. The shoe rack, definitely, and the cat tower and these puzzle boards. All of our biggest sellers have been products that have been suggested by our followers. Are you planning on going back to B2B after? We are working through that at the moment, and we certainly want events to come back and be a part of that. I can see that we'll probably operate two businesses in parallel. They're both great businesses, and we really are looking forward to events coming back. Unfortunately, I don't think it's going to be for a little while. Yeah. What's your sort of fear? Like, obviously, we can't predict the future, but from everything that you've heard, what's your vibe around? Obviously, you're working on large-scale events. When do you feel that's going to be coming back? I don't think we'll see a very big music festival here, 20, 30,000 people. I don't think we're going to see that this summer, at least this summer. I think certainly smaller events are coming back and people are finding new ways to do that and to be able to socially distance and do that the right way. And the big thing is for people to come with confidence. And I think if people are putting things in place that they can be socially distanced and they feel confident, then people will start coming back to events. But I think the days of having 20,000 people jammed in the front of a stage, I think they're a little ways off. Do you think they will come back? We've had pandemics before and people talk about the Spanish flu and whatnot, but we obviously didn't have music festivals like we do now as well. I'm interested to hear your thoughts on how the events industry is going to look different when things do change. I think that we'll find a way to get people back together. It's human nature that we need to have events and need to have that interaction. So I think that definitely they will come back. How they'll look, I'm not sure. I've seen a few examples recently of individual little decks throughout the field for people to stand on. And I just don't know how that would work financially longer term. It's great to see and great to see people innovating and trying to come up with other ideas. But I think financially that needs to work as well. And I think smaller events will come back sooner than later. And I don't know about the big ones. Yeah, it's interesting there hearing you mention that platforms for people to stand on, for example, and space out some of the guests or patrons or you know, participants, the uh, attendees of these festivals. But yeah, I was just interested to hear your thoughts on that one because you're obviously dealing a lot with the, the actual construction of these sites. I was interested to hear your thoughts on what that might actually look like there, Jeremy. 
What are you learning about or exploring at the moment? You're obviously learning about this emerging work from home market that we don't have a name for, but what else are you learning about or exploring more personally? Uh, They could be for something else you even want to execute on. Yeah, I'm actually working at the moment through some, it's more along the lines of keeping people mentally better off while they're at home in in isolation. So we're actually working through, we're calling them, I don't know if you've seen our logo, we basically just put a line through the stages part for now and said work from home proper furniture. So we're developing that further and and the next things we're working on is isolation activities, uh, something to keep people's minds busy while they're at home. So we're working on some puzzles and some puzzles of events, basically, so that people can't get to a live music, so they can do some puzzles of those. And we're, we're looking at a lot of things around that at the moment and trying to develop things to keep people mentally stimulated. I have a question on something that you mentioned just a little bit earlier. It was used in passing there where you said that you had this prototype and then you 3D printed something and then you had the website up and you were learning on the fly. But I want to focus on the 3D printing aspect. Is that something that you guys had already been doing? Was that something that that you just learned in a day and did as well? It is something we had been doing. We'll often 3D print a small prototype of stages that we're planning. And Mick also runs the 3D printer. And and so we find it's a good way to actually show people they they can actually feel in 3D what something's going to look like. And to see these desks in the exact pieces that we were going to make, just small prototypes, it was great. So you did just make a miniature version of that desk. It wasn't like you 3D printed the whole desk and and that was your prototype. No, just miniature. Okay. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. I thought I'd clarify that one as well because from what I was hearing there or thinking it could have been that you've built this 3D desk and then you start selling 3D printed things and then you're in this huge manufacturing world yeah. that, that opens up to you. Funnily enough, we are actually working on some small little devices uh, and holders and things that are 3D printed. So there's a few things like that in the concept stage. Yeah, anything you want to share? Look, we're working on some iPad holders and iPhone holders and the one in particular at the moment is an iPad holder to put into cars. Yeah, so we've got a few ideas like that. That's the one that's closest. Yeah, fantastic. And now with an iPad holder in a car, I keep coming back to what products you might even make next. And as you said there, it's totally community driven. So is is there anything that is emergent from within the team that you're thinking, okay, this is a thing that people haven't said that I think we need? Is there any of that happening? Yeah, look, there is somewhat. Our our team often will come up with modifications to things that we've already got that that makes them better. For example, we made a wine rack since from the early days, fit six bottles and, and they stack and fit side to side. One of the team came up with a way to actually make that into a shelving unit and it was brilliant. So we've actually made that now as a prototype and there's a couple of people that are ordering them. So they're not on the site, but those sorts of things. The team are very involved. How do you go through that process of then iterating that? The number of people who are obviously looking at what you're doing and purchasing your products is rapidly increasing as well. So are you adjusting the process of product iteration now or are you very much just doing it and seeing what sticks then? We do it. In some circumstances, we'll put it out on to social media and say that we're working on a couple of options. What do you guys think? Quite often, people will call and want different versions of things, bigger desktop or smaller or lower. And so we, we're actually 30% or so of what we're doing at the moment is customer. We've got a guy, Nick, who purely does custom orders, and that's where we're doing these temporary pop-up shop fit-outs and things like that. So we're doing quite a lot of that custom work. That's fantastic to hear. Jeremy, what innovations have you seen in the industry? And So we're talking, obviously, we're talking about huge change happening at the moment with this particular subset that you've been able to deal in with constructing, as you said there, even pop-up sites. So you've gone from massive scale to small scale, even retail there. I'd love to hear just a little bit more about the event space and what innovations you've seen in events in the time that you've been dealing in it. The events industry as a whole are very innovative anyway. They're always coming up with new ideas. And I think if someone's going to make something happen quickly, it'll be an event person. And so these guys, I, I am seeing some amazing stuff. The first one was really turning events virtual. So there's whole exhibitions now that are operating virtually and awards nights that are happening virtually over Zoom and having people at home and in the studio. That's the first thing that's happened. But there's so many great examples. I was doing a talk the other day with jeans manufacturer. They make jeans for everything and they've turned to making all PPE and they've got government grants now to make PPE. And yeah, it's quite amazing some of the changes. Yes. Jeremy, at the moment, what are you dealing with that you're experiencing friction around? Is there anything or what is it that you're experiencing the most friction around. You must be learning a lot really quickly. 
What's challenging you at the moment? The thing that we're focusing and I'm focusing particularly on at the moment is finding efficiencies. So we're really, we're seeing the swing back to Australian manufacturing and wanting to buy local. It's very strong and we want to continue with that. And to do that though, we need to become more efficient. Like I mentioned, we've made mistakes and we've learned from those. And to start with, we were doing things like we had event crew delivering everything, which was great and an amazing part of the story that we could support those guys. But what we've done now is we've pulled them back into the workshop and they're helping in the workshop and we've got more efficient ways of delivering through delivery partners. So really it's finding the most efficient way to do things. How we've got a workshop there that's generally full of scaffold and truss. We've now got it full of sanding desks and packaging areas and dispatch and finding the best way for that to the flow through there. It's a, for, for it to work long term, we need that to be really efficient. For those who haven't dealt in this space, and maybe for a bit of insight for those who have, what are the sorts of inefficiencies you've picked up? Because your answer was actually looking for efficiencies, and I want to pull that out just a little more. Are you finding inefficiencies and removing them, or are you finding efficiencies and doubling down? And what do they actually look like? Can you give us some examples? Yeah, really both is the answer there. Firstly, because we're cutting so many pieces, we've been utilizing three CNC routers. So that's the computer run cutting machine that we use. And we've been running three of those. One we own, two are external. Now, for us to utilize those external routers, and when our machine's working 24 hours a day, so we're really churning through it, but we've got to drive materials to the other shops, and then they cut that there, and then we need to bring it back again and then sand it. And so there's quite an inefficient use of time there. Whereas we're looking at now another machine that will self-load and self-unload, and we can cut three times the amount of material in the same amount of time. So we're working on those sorts of efficiencies in cash flow. The other one is we've been hand sanding everything up until a month ago, everything was hand sanded. So a very beautiful finish and everyone took a lot of time to make sure it was great, which was again, part of the story. But now what we're doing is we've got a bigger drum sanding machine that sands the whole sheet apply. And then we just need the crew just to touch it up at the end. So it makes that process much faster and more efficient. I can imagine that you're building these things and you're learning on the go, on the fly. And essentially, I can imagine there must be so many times now that you'll build something and then you'll do research or you hear from someone. I can imagine you'll have these experiences where you go, oh my God, there's, a, there's actually a machine that does that. Oh, I didn't even know that existed. And then it's, let's get it so we can make it faster. Well, that's right. There's a machine or an app for example, to start with my wife and I at 10 o'clock every night, we'd look at what the orders had come through. We'd print them all out and we'd then fold them up and put them in a little envelope that then got stuck on the front of the desk before it got delivered. So we were doing that with hundreds of products after the first month. And we thought this is, there's got to be a better way. Then we incorporated the Shopify site with ShipIt, which is the courier company we're utilizing. And then we've also got another system now called Katana, which an order comes in. It tells us what we have in stock, what we're short, what we need to cut. And it's all now all automated. The label gets printed up at the dispatch area and my wife and I can go to bed at a reasonable hour now. Jeremy, ultimately, what does success look like for this business? Are you planning to to build it and sell it off or do you want to hold on to it as things grow and as the events industry comes back? Is it essentially just balancing your own portfolio or what's the sort of the future of this business look like? We've got such a following now for this ISO King furniture we're making, the ISO King range, we call it. And someone actually mentioned to me the other day, they said, you've made a bit of a cult. The support we're getting is mind blowing. You know, we've got people that are essentially buying every product to have the collection. It's, it's something that I feel that we need to keep it going now because we got such a following and such support. So yeah, we'll keep it going and continue hopefully to supply what people want. Fantastic. What plans do you have for the industry and the way that you want to contribute as things do move forward? Yeah, the event industry is so close to our heart. All of our friends are in the industry and we know everyone and everyone's hurting at the moment. So we're doing what we can. Like I mentioned we're utilizing out-of-work event crew to help us throughout the process. And we've actually put an additional 70 people on our books since starting to make this furniture. So we're really quite fortunate we've been able to do that. The other thing we've been able to do is donate $10 from every desk we've sold to Support Act. So Support Act's the organization that's supporting out-of-work musicians, and event crew and the events industry was hit hard and first besides airlines the events uh, industry was shut down very early and like we've been talking about it it could potentially be one of the last things to come back so i think that ongoing support that support act is offering is really important to us wonderful jeremy i have one last question for you today who would you like to hear on the show 
Being a hospitality and our background in the music industry, I think one of the greatest live music venues is a small bar in Cronulla in the south of Sydney called the Brass Monkey. Now, Jeff Trio, who owns that, is amazing. And the stories he has of the people that have been through there, some of the biggest names doing their first ever shows in there. So he's been running that venue for 25 years and it's quite amazing. And I think the stories he'd have to tell would be really interesting to your listeners. Beautiful. Well, look, thank you so much for being on the show today, Jeremy. I really appreciate you coming on and what an incredible story. So thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure chatting. Thanks for having me. This program is hosted by James Henderson with technical production by Jake Olver. Voiceovers were by Angus Brennan and Shim Phelan. Thanks to our distribution team led by Stephanie Holland and a special thanks to you for tuning in every week. This program was produced by H Media. We'll see you soon.